Okay. So, that is the world's shortest trailer. Um, and last week, my very, very good friend Martin spoke, and he made some comments about how it's a spooky trailer, the music is eerie and frightening. But actually, tonight's topic, it fits here perfectly, because it has a sense of mystery, has a sense of wonder, and it has a sense of awe. And tonight we're talking about the life to come. We're talking about what happens when you die. We're talking about the resurrection. Now, if you're new to church, whether that's here in the room or listening, watching online, you just need to know that there are some things that you have with Christianity that are very easy to understand. Principles for living. How to negotiate and navigate life in a really great way. Easy to understand. But there are some things that actually require uh, a kind of spiritual revelation and understanding in order to wrap your heads around them. And that's what tonight is going to be. Tonight is going to be a little bit of a kind of, it's a big mind-bending topic, the whole thing of resurrection. But it's really, really important. Now, just to kind of wind up what we've been talking about with the book of Corinthians, there's a reason that you have the letter to the Corinthians, the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Galatians, the letter to the Thessalonians. Because different people in different contexts, in different cultures, in different parts of the world, have a different experience. And the experience that you are brought up in, it can impact and inform how you think about faith. And so the people in Corinth were affected by the culture and the thinking of Corinth. Now, Corinth was this incredible Greek city. It was on this land bridge separating North Greece from South Greece. It was on a major land trade route and a major sea trade route. So it was fabulously wealthy. It was a Roman capital, the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. And so the Romans had basically sacked the, the, uh, the city and then rebuilt it in their own image. So it was the best of Rome with the best of Greece. It was the might and the glory of the Roman Empire married to the philosophy, the culture, the art, the highbrow thinking of the Greeks. And so you had this very kind of cosmopolitan city. And because it's this port, it's also incredibly progressive, very promiscuous. And what Paul does is he says, listen, if you're living in this culture, if you're living in this city, you've got to understand that it affects you. It impacts you. And some of the things that we think that we're doing that are just Christian, we're just being Christian. Actually, it's not Christian at all. It's cultural. We are affected by the culture. We're affected by the sea that we swim in. And we started off this series by saying that culture shapes behavior and behavior shapes character. So more than we are willing to admit, the culture that we live in actually shapes the things that we do. And the things that we do determine the character that we have formed within us. Now, Paul specifically calls this out in chapter 15, which is our subject today. One of the longest chapters in the New Testament. And Paul says, he says this, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And again, Paul's really, really good because what he's doing is he is quoting from a Greek poet. So he's using the things that people have heard in their culture and then he's seeing this is how we apply this in our Christian faith. Bad company corrupts good character. Now, what we're going to talk about tonight is the... Uh, the, the kind of the message of resurrection. So it's basically theology. It's the study of scripture. And you say, well, how does the culture that I'm around, how does the company that I keep affect my understanding of scripture? But it does. If we're not aware of our cultural influences, we will not really know how to navigate our Christian faith. What is actually scriptural and what is just cultural? Now, the thing when it comes to this particular topic of the resurrection, the life to come, the age to come, the thing that has affected the Corinthian church is exactly the same kind of thinking that affects us today. The parallels are so huge. And the, the kind of the thought and the, the, um, the saying that the Corinthians had is one that you'd be very familiar with. It's this, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Who's heard the expression, eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow we die? 
Okay, most of us, not everyone, but most of us. It's a really well-known expression. Okay, let me try this one. Who's heard the expression YOLO? All right, that's a bit more like it. Shout out, what does YOLO mean? You You only live once. The same thing. It's the same kind of cultural message. It's the, the kind of the banner message of materialism that says all that matters is matter. The only reality is the reality that we live in right now. So eat, drink, be merry. You only live once. Tomorrow you're going to die. Your life is finite. Your life is bounded. Your life has this existential full stop at the end. And so you should just eat and you should drink. You should be merry. You should live your life. You should live your best life. And that was the kind of the culture, that was the thinking, that was the message that these Corinthian believers have been brought up with, saturated in their minds, absolutely marinated in this kind of cultural thinking. Eat, drink, tomorrow we die. You only live once. Now, what does that mean for us? It means that if we're not careful, the Christianity that we have is very much based on how I live today. So it's like I do my Christian faith, but it makes my life better because you only live once. And our focus, our attention, our values are all about this life. There are some people, and maybe if you're here and you're not sure about Christianity, or you're finding your way back to Christianity, or you're on the edge, on the outside looking in, you might think, oh yeah, Christianity, I can see the appeal because it's all about a great way to live. It's all about believing something positive and uplifting. It's about being in great community. And it's about helping others. That's not a bad thing to live for. That will give you a good life. And you can think that Christianity is just about how I make my life now better. How I live my life in a more fulfilling way. How I live my best life. Our culture, it wants to live the best life, right? You go onto the Instagrams and you go onto the face pages and you'll see all these posts about how you should live your best life. And as Christians, we can get just sucked into that mindset that our faith is just one of those things it's like Pilates, something that you do to make your life better. It's an optional extra bit of icing on your life cake. And we have this idea that uh, we don't really think about what's coming. We just think about this life. Our decisions based on this life. Our values based on this life. Our faith based on this life. And Paul says, you just really got to get over this stuff because that's not Christianity. That's something else. That's some kind of self-help, make your life a little bit better kind of thinking. But that's never what Christianity was all about Christianity following Jesus is fundamentally about what happens in an age to come beyond death. And actually, if you take that hope out, you haven't got a hope at all. You can't just say, well, you know what? Even if there's no resurrection, even if there's no going to heaven when you die, it's still a great way to live. Paul says, that's just not true. If that's true in your life, you're doing it wrong. Christianity is about sacrifice, taking up your cross, walking a narrow way. Yes, there's blessings in it. Yes, I'd still choose it. But fundamentally, I can't just go saying, well, it's all about this life. It's all about the here and the now. It's all about the physical and the material. This is what Paul says in verse 19. He says this, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not living my best life. Jesus and following him is not just making a good life a little bit better, 5% better. No, because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of the call of God on my life, I'm actually sacrificing. I'm actually denying myself. I'm giving myself for others. I am not allowing myself to do things that I have every right to do because That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is not just, here's a set of rules on how to live. The gospel isn't just, here's a great thing to believe in that makes wonderful community. No, the gospel, the good news, is good news about an event that happened and it changed reality as we know it. It changed humanity. It changed space 
time. It changed the very nature of what it means to be human. That's the resurrection. The good news is that Jesus rose from the dead. So Paul says, this is the gospel. Anything less, it's not the gospel. This is the gospel. This is what I received. He says this. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's a Greek name for Peter. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. When I say fall asleep, that's not what you're about to do in my preach. It is uh, literally a euphemism for death. So some have died, but most of them are still alive. Eyewitnesses, you can check them out. Look them up. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Paul is saying this, the gospel isn't just that God loves me and makes my life better. The gospel is that God came to this world in human form. He lived, he died on the cross as the scriptures spoke and he rose again. And that's the thing that we focus in on the resurrection. And it's so important that it's backed up by all these eyewitnesses. 500 at one time. Most of them still alive. You can see them. Tell me that I'm a liar. Check them out. Name names. Cephas, James, his brother. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you'd risen from the dead? This is amazing stuff. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you are God incarnate? Amazing stuff. Well, the resurrection, that'll do it. What would you do to convince someone like Paul, who was an opponent of Christianity, that it's all true. Well, you rise from the dead and you appear to him. Okay, Paul's like, I'm in. That is, yeah, you got my attention. But it's something that is so profound, so powerful, that it changes everything. Why is this important? It's important because the Bible says repeatedly, and actually, 1 Corinthians 15, it's got 58 verses. It's one of the longest chapters in the whole New Testament. You really need to go home and read it. This is your homework. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it will blow your pants off. It is one of the best passages in all of scripture. But it's kind of delving into these things. And what he says in this chapter, and I'm just kind of focusing on a few key verses, but there's so much more riches there. But what he says is, Jesus rising from the dead is important because it is a foretaste of what will happen to us. Jesus is the prototype, the forerunner. He's the first to go through. And what has happened to Jesus is going to happen to you. Turn to the person next to you and say, what has happened to Jesus is going to happen to you. Okay, so now you ask the question, well, what does this look like? Okay, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but how many of you, when you think about the life to come, when you think about the resurrection, when you think about going to heaven when you die, how many of you, it's some kind of version, give or take, Ghostbusters. So it's like an ethereal, spiritual, transparent kind of thing. And you're sitting on a, I mean, basically it's clouds and harps, clouds and harps for billions of years. We have this thing. Most of us, it's like, this life is great. We've got McDonald's and we've got rugby and we've got Zara and we've got all this stuff and it's fantastic. And then life to come, clouds, harps, clouds, harps. It's ethereal. It's kind of floating through stuff and being kind of like a ghost forever and ever and ever and ever. Just singing hymns and thinking, oh man, I really miss the times when... You could have had a McDonald's. You know, it's, it's, it's this weird thing. Listen, if you get nothing else than this, listen to this. The key thing that Paul talks about when he talks about resurrection and that reality of what is going to happen to us is body. Everyone say body. 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 We are not disembodied spirits. Who are you going to call? We are bodies. Ah, that's the next question. What kind of body? What are we talking? Are we talking like another body like this? Some of you are like, oh, 
I struggle a little bit with this body. I was hoping to get something a little bit better. I don't want to kind of come back, just all funny knees and everything. Uh, what kind of a body are you going to have? This is what Paul says, verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Really glad that you asked that question. And what it does is it brings us into a little bit of a technical passage. So we're going to get a little bit technical here. I'm going to just scratch the surface. But bear with me, okay? If this goes... If this doesn't jibe with you, just think body. That's all you need to know. But there's two things. There's physical and the spiritual. Or there's natural and there's spiritual. When we think of bodies and the life to come and resurrection, we think, oh, I'm going to be a spirit. I'm going to be in some kind of heavenly realm. And uh, I will go off and it'd be totally different to what I've had. I'll have a kind of a spirit, spooky ectoplasm kind of experience. Not like the physical, natural thing that we have here. Okay, so this is what Paul says. And he explains what he means by spiritual, what he means by natural. He says, if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Everyone say spiritual body. No, not spirit. But spiritual body, body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, Adam, Genesis 1, became a living being. The last Adam, who's the last Adam? Very good. A life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. Everyone say, of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Everyone say, of heaven. Okay, so what you've got is you've got two contrasting things. And it's like two contrasting atoms. The first atom of the dust of the earth. First atom has a, it's a life, what is it? It says a living being. Okay, a being with a life in him. The last Adam, sometimes the Bible calls him the second Adam, is just basically, Adam just means man. You know that, right? It's just the Hebrew word for man. Uh, The first man, the kind of the first human 1.0 of the dust. Natural. Human 2.0, the last Adam, Jesus of heaven and a life-giving spirit. Not just I am a being that's full of life, but... I am a being that is giving life. I am pulsating. Dynamic life is flowing out. And I'm a life-giving spirit in a spiritual body. Now, if you go into a garage, garage, and you say, I would like to buy a car. Man comes up, could be a woman, you know. Uh, just this is a story. So don't, don't hate me. Someone comes up, owner comes up, and they say, Here's an option. You can have petrol car or electric car. And you go, what? Petrol car? It's a car made of petrol? How does it even go? All wishy-washy liquid petrol. And an electric car? Oh, I've got to see this electric car made of pure electricity. What? That is amazing. And they said, no, you're an idiot. That's not what we mean when we say petrol car, electric car. What is a petrol car? What's the difference between a petrol car and an electric car? How it's powered. Nice one. Chaz, was that you, Chaz? Let's give a round of applause for Chaz. How it's powered. Not what it's made of. So Paul is saying, when I talk natural, I'm not talking about what it's made of. And spiritual is made of spirit. I'm talking about how it's powered. Now, your petrol car is smelly, prone to breaking down, lots of moving parts. Your electric car, sleek, the silent killer. I nearly got mowed down by one the other day. But it is energized by electricity and it operates differently. No moving parts, just sleek acceleration and speed. So an electric car looks very much like a petrol car. And the petrol car looks very much like an electric car. But they're fundamentally different because of how they are powered. 
Now, the thing breaks down because what we're talking about is we're not talking about the difference between a petrol car and an electric car. We're talking about a petrol car and that car from Back to the Future when he comes back and it's powered by a flux capacitor uh, and nuclear reactions or whatever. And it's just unlimited power. But it's essentially what Paul is saying is he's saying the natural body, the first body, Adam number one, all of us like that. It's, we're powered by natural processes. We are subject to the laws of entropy and decay. We're subject to a lot of moving parts that break down, that don't work. Not just physically, but mentally. We can be messed up. We can have all kinds of runaway thoughts. We can have inbuilt imbalances that make us predisposed to difficulty in life. And we're made of this natural, of the earth, of the dust of the earth body. But Paul is saying what God has got for us. It's a body, a body, but it is empowered by the spirit. It is unlimited. It is without any kind of boundary on it. It is fundamentally glorious in the way that it's put together. And so when we talk about a spiritual reality, we're not talking about dun, 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 dun. we're talking about a life that is no longer just received, but it is spiritual, is of heaven. I am made and created out of the stuff of God's presence itself. I'm life-giving. I am this kind of incredibly energizing being. That is what Jesus is when he rises from the dead. He becomes, as the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. And so there's two key words in this whole conversation. The first word is body. And the second word is changed. Changed. It's a body... But it's changed. It's transformed. This is amazing. Explain, Paul. I will. Glad you asked. Verse 51, he says this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. Lean in. This is a mystery. This is stuff that most people don't know. We will not all sleep. Okay, euphemism again. We will not all die. But we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed oh my giddy aunt this thing it's like some will die but not everybody there'll be some alive who will see Jesus return and the trumpet this kind of incredible a uh, climactic moment in human history. A resurrection happens. You say, well, what happened to the people that died before the resurrection? Well, maybe we'll look at that in hubs. That's a whole different thing. But essentially, whether you died a thousand years ago or yesterday or you're still alive, there's going to be one moment in history when everyone who loves Jesus, who knows Jesus, who's filled with the spirit of Jesus, changed, transformed in an instant. And it will be radical. This is what we talk about with the resurrection. Now, the, the Jewish people, the original OG Jews, they had this kind of theology of resurrection, that resurrection would be one event in human history that would happen at the end of human history, when God would just call time, blow a whistle, and then there's the judgment, and then everyone is resurrected, all the dead that have ever died, resurrected. And it will happen at the end of time. All together. So when people have said, Jesus has risen from the dead, they're like, well, clearly he hasn't because no one else has risen. You're not just going to get like a bit of a resurrection and then everyone else. But that's exactly what the Bible says. That's how God has done it. It's almost like we have Jesus risen as a taster, a starter, a proto. And then later on, at the end of time, when God wraps up human history, everyone else has risen. And we have this event. We will all be changed. Resurrection isn't just God brings me back to life. Do you know, we sang a song this morning. 
And um, in fact, yeah, I'll get on to that in, in a little while. Let me tell you the uh, metaphor that Paul uses, because it's really, really great. And it's a way of helping us understand. And again, if you don't get it, don't worry. All you need to know is body changed. That's it. That's my message. Body changed. Two words. Remember that. But Paul's giving us a little bit of an insight. He says this. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. What does this mean? Well, it means if you want to plant an orange bush to get an orange from that, right? Yeah, that's how you get oranges. At the bio- Chaz. Okay, fine. A tree. If you want to plant an orange tree, um, then you uh, don't get like a, a big orange tree uh, from another place in the, the orange country and dig a big hole and then put the orange tree in, put the soil over it. And then out of the soil, it grows, ah, the orange trees come out. You don't even take like a little mini bonsai orange tree and say, oh, this is going to grow up into a real big tree. And, and you plant it in the ground and then, you know, summer comes whenever, is it summer when things come out? Harvest time, whenever ground comes up, oh, it's an orange. Well, I knew it was going to be an orange tree because it was a little tiny baby orange tree before. No, what you put into the ground bears very little resemblance to what comes out. And Paul says, the, 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 what you plant, you don't plant the body that will be. You don't plant the thing that's coming out. What do you do? You plant a seed. And out of that seed, something comes out miraculously that looks Nothing like, well, well, a little bit like, because an orange seed is a pip. Is that right, Chaz? Yeah. Checking my homework. Little pip. Who's eaten a pip in an orange? Okay, we know what a pip is like. It's kind of like woody and organic. It's not some kind of chromy, shiny, mirror ball type machine. It, it looks kind of woody and organic. A little bit like a tree, but... Very, very, very little bit. The tree that comes out, so much more wonderful. Or you could plant like a beautiful, beautiful plant, like an orchid. And again, you don't put like a little baby orchid. Oh, this thing is so gorgeous. I'm putting a little baby orchid into the ground. Out comes a big orchid. No, you put in an orchid seed. Looks nothing like the finished product, but it comes out. It's like, oh my goodness. What came out was just so much better. And so when Paul talks about resurrection, he says, God will, your seed, your body is buried in the ground. But then what comes out in resurrection is so far superior. You can't even imagine. I tried it this morning at our service. I was talking about, um, I've just read the trilogy, The Three Body Problem, Chinese science fiction, hard science fiction. Anyone read The Three Body Problem? <sighs> it was the same this morning. It's like, what do you guys read? Other things. <laughs> what? <laughs> Harry Potter? The Bible. Very good. Oh, Johnny. Nailed it. Anyway. So it didn't work this morning. It's not going to work this evening either. But it's a hard science fiction. There's one passage where these um, crew members in a ship, spaceship, they enter a period, um, an area of space where there's a wormhole that has a pocket that will take you into four-dimensional space. And they go through it. And first of all, they can't handle it. And they're kind of throwing up and being sick and totally disorientated. But after a while, they become addicted because this four-dimensional space that they're able to inhabit is so much more expansive and wonderful and glorious than the three-dimensional reality that they're used to. And when they come back into three-dimensional reality, they are just, they feel claustrophobic and enclosed. And they, they just miss that thing. Now, I know that that makes me sound like an enormous nerd, but it's a great great concept. But this idea of multiple dimensions existing and living, we know from physics of of all the different dimensions, you know, string theory, quantums, all of that stuff, uh, different dimensions of reality. I mean, Matt, this is your area, right? 
kind of, black holes. Can you imagine being in a black hole, all the dimensions folded in, sucked? I mean, this is stuff that is outside of our brain. And Paul says, forget all that stuff. Just know that it's like putting an orange pit into the ground and seeing an orange tree come out. Something that is a little bit like it, but a billion times better. And yet it is not less physical. It's not less organic. It's more. It is a greater expression of that little potential that was in it. Sometimes people think that you live in the age to come and it's just going to be boring. Harps and clouds, harps and clouds. But actually the biblical vision of this is that it is so much more wonderful than anything that we can possibly imagine. I'm going to be creative in the age to come. I'm going to be relational in the age to come. I'm going to be exploring in the age to come. I'm going to be surfing dark matter and visiting supernova. I'm going to be bathed in the glory of the cosmos. I'm going to have no limit. I'm going to be glorious. It's not just being resuscitated. The, um, the, the thing that we, we sang this morning is this great song. Living hope. Hallelujah. Dun, 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 dun. Hallelujah. Something, something, something me. Da, 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 da. Hallelujah. My living hope. You know the song? Okay. But there's this verse in it, and it says this. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Now, it's great poetry. It's great imagery. It's not great theology because it's not like the Holy Spirit and the angels of heaven were crowding around Jesus's dead body in the tomb going clear. And he, oh, the patients come back. This is not some kind of resuscitation. This is an act of God's cosmic power, unbelievable majesty and might. And in an instant, Jesus's body is suddenly from a seed to the final thing, in an instant, transformed, changed. Not just, oh, wow, that was a bit rough. Oh, I better chomp down to my disciples. No, it's a brand new experience. Adam, the last Adam, humanity 2.0, a life-giving spirit, a whole different kind of body, spirit-empowered. What does that look like? Paul says this, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is why we need to have a theology of resurrection. We need to have a tangible hope of the age to come. I'm not just going for something that is YOLO. That it's going to make this life a little bit better. Actually, this life might be challenging. It might be awful. This life might be intentionally of my own volition harder than it should be. I might deny myself. Why? Because I've got a vision of what God can do in the future. But it changes my whole feeling about how I do my faith. Some of you, you hold back in your faith because you think, yeah, but I don't want to give too much. I don't want to suffer too much. I've got to take care of myself. YOLO. But the Bible says, actually, this is a life that is just a shadow of what God has for us. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king and we're going to be transformed and we're going to be like Jesus. And so therefore, I can I can deny myself. Therefore, I can give. Therefore, I can live fully for the kingdom. Two weeks time. We're doing love running. Put your hand up if you're doing love running. Okay. In, yeah, nice. In the house. We're running the Bristol 10K. And Matthew, are you doing the half? Ridiculous. It sounds like, what have I got myself into? But, you know, those of us doing it, we are intentionally denying ourselves. I mean, I am. I, um, I heard Steve Bodley talking. He's doing this 100K thing, you know, just upping the stakes. And he came around to my house the other day. I said, hey, Steve, would you like a glass of wine? He said, no, no. I'm doing the run. I'm like, yeah, yeah, me, me, me too. Um, 
and I've taken a leaf out of his book. So I'm denying myself. I'm doing the training. Matthew, earlier on, before the service, he was sitting down on the floor while we all prayed together. It took him five minutes to get up because he did a 16K run, what, yesterday or Friday. Friday, even worse. I mean, he's a wreck. He's, he's barely <laughs> functioning. But he's doing that because he's got a vision of what it counts. So I go through all this stuff with love running. I am watching what I eat. I'm not drinking alcohol, which is a difficult thing for me because I do like a drop of alcohol from time to time. Uh, I don't know why I did that voice. But I am I'm denying myself because I'm joking. I'm, I'm completely. Anyway, um, <coughs> denying myself because we get to raise all this money to set free children caught in sexual online exploitation and for the needs of our city. And that is worth doing. But two short weeks after I've run the race, I'm going to be in a five-star hotel enjoying the sweet life. I'm going to be sipping pina coladas by my pool in Bali. Uh, and we're going on from that. We're having our sabbatical, which um, hopefully you've heard about by now. Please don't feel sorry for us. It's a thing that we're going to do. But... It's like I can endure difficulty, hardship, pain, suffering, because I know that A, it's worth it, and it's going to achieve something, and B, there is something to look forward to beyond that. But if we have only hope for this life, we have most men to be pitied. That's why a theology of hope, that's why a theology of resurrection really helps us. So this is how Paul closes up the chapter. He says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If I believe that one day I'm going to be transformed, I'm going to have a resurrection body, then I can go through difficulty, pain, suffering. I can give myself to the work of the Lord. And I can give myself fully because I know that this world, it's light and momentary, any suffering that I go through. And actually, it's not in vain. It makes a difference. It counts. You say, I've been speaking to my friends at work about Jesus and nothing seems to have happened. It's not in vain. You say, I have done all this stuff and I've prayed all these prayers and they don't all get answered. He says, it's okay. It's not in vain. None of this is wasted. There is a life to come. You say, well, I was in Hub and I invested in it and then everyone left and the thing just isn't what it used to be. It's okay. Whatever you did, it's not in vain. I give myself fully to the work of the Lord because I know that he has a great future for me. No more crying there. No more dying there. No more anxiety. No more cancer. No more depression no more crushing self-doubt. No more sickness. No more bereavement. No more aching. No more breaking. A powered body that I can't begin to get my head around. But this is the big idea. The future hope of resurrection needs to inform how we live today. Our future is a body that is transformed, eternal, and beyond our wildest dreams. Because of that, we can serve God's kingdom wholeheartedly. I want us to pray, and I want us to ask God to really help us. I know it's difficult to live your life today with a vision of what may be tomorrow, particularly when you can't see it. But we know that Jesus rose from the dead, and so we are fully convinced that this is our hope. So we don't mind what we suffer. We don't mind how we give. And we don't mind what it costs. We don't mind what our challenges are. We have perseverance in adversity. Because we know that one day we will be transformed in a blink of an eye. A trumpet. Transformation. Changed. And it's glorious beyond belief. So let's pray.